Hi, I'm Beth Beluccio. I'm the Global Clinical Lead for Rare Neurological Disorders at Pfizer. And I'm really happy that PPMD asked us to share some of our information around um, Pfizer's investigational gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, of course, what I'm going to be saying uh, today uh, includes information that, about things that will happen in the future, and there's always um, some uncertainty about that. Things, are, things can change. Um, what I'd like to talk to you today about is um, a brief update on our ongoing Phase 1B study. Um, then a few um, um, new pieces of information around our Phase 3 study, um, some of the information about sites and about our dose. And then I wanted to spend a fair amount of time talking about um, zero conversion and neutralizing antibodies. So first, briefly, just to talk about our um, Phase 1B study. As you probably know, um, this is an ongoing study. It's listed on clintrials.gov, and the sites are continuing to enroll additional study participants. So far, we've dosed 13 boys, um, three at the low dose and 10 at the high dose. And last year at the PPMD conference, Michael Binks um, provided some early information on this study. And then just earlier this year in May, he presented at a scientific conference um, uh, the more recent update of our preliminary results. And that um, presentation is available on Pfizer.com, so I'm not going to go into a lot of those details right now. Just wanted to give you kind of a high-level summary, and that is that um, with regard to safety, we have had a total of three serious adverse events so far. Two of those Michael Binks um, reported last year at the PPMD conference, and so we've just had one since then. Um, and we do have additional data um, giving us some preliminary signs of efficacy across multiple endpoints, um, some of which are illustrated at the bottom of the slide. But the most important thing about this preliminary data is that it's supportive of us moving into phase three which, as you know, is really important to collecting the data that are required um, by regulatory agencies like the FDA um, when they want to review a drug for approval. So what I really want to turn to now is our phase three study. Um, so there's a lot of information about the design details of our phase three study um, on clintrials.gov. And I've also given a couple of presentations earlier this year that are available online again, around the details of the design. So I'm not going to spend a lot more time talking about that today, but I did want to remind you of a couple of things using the schematic at the bottom of the slide. <clears throat> so one thing is that the um, study is a randomized placebo-controlled study, and our randomization rate is two to one. So what that means is that for the, um, of, of the approximately 99 participants that will enroll in the study, about two-thirds, or 66 of them, will be assigned to cohort one, and we'll get the investigational gene therapy at the beginning of the study. About one-third of the participants, or 33, will be assigned to cohort two, and those boys will get placebo at the beginning of the study, and then at the beginning of year two, um, they may be eligible for getting the investigational gene therapy. For the cohort two boys, just before the beginning of year two, they'll be tested for neutralizing antibodies to make sure it's still safe for them to receive the gene therapy. And I'm going to come back to that a little bit later in the presentation um, and, and talk to you more about neutralizing antibodies. But before I leave this slide, I want to tell you about something that we think is very exciting, and that is that we've selected a name for our phase three study, and that will be the CIFRIO study. So CIFRIO is a comet. It was discovered not too long ago by a, a woman scientist whose last name is CIFRIO. And this fits in with the general space theme that we've um, selected for, our, for all of the studies that will be part of our um, gene therapy program for Duchenne. So um, the reason we've chosen a space theme is that we were thinking about the time a long time ago when astronauts first went into space. And it was a really exciting time, but there was really a lot that was not known yet. And so those astronauts had to be explorers, and they contributed a lot to our understanding of the science of space. 
And we think that gene therapy is kind of like that now. It's super exciting, um, but there's still a lot to learn. And we think that the boys and their families who participate in clinical studies are sort of like those astronauts, being explorers and contributing a lot to our understanding of science. Um, so going forward, we'll be talking about our phase three as the Cifrio study. And I wanted to tell you a couple more things about it. The first is around the, the sites that we'll have for the study. So a lot of people, when they first hear about the study, the first thing they want to know is about our sites. Um, we will have many, many sites within the U.S. And as soon as a site opens for enrollment and is ready to um, uh, start having contact from families, we will list it on clinicaltrials.gov. We can't list sites in advance until they're really ready. Um, but I wanted to show you this map of the United States just to reassure you that um, in every region of the United States as shown here on the map, we have at least one site and usually many more than that. And we've done this so that families um, won't have to travel far uh, to be able to participate in the study. Um, of course, we also will have some sites outside of the US and we'll also post those on clinicaltrials.gov just as soon as they're ready to, they're open and ready for enrollment. So the next thing I want to tell you about our Cifrio study is about the dose. Um, there's a lot of information on this slide, but the most important thing is actually at the very bottom in the blue box, um, which is that we will be taking the high dose from the phase one study into the phase three study. It's the exact same dose, um, but you'll see that the numbers changed. Um, so in the Phase one study, we call the high dose 3E to the 14th vector genomes per kilogram. And in the phase three Cifrio study, we will call it 2E to the 14th vector genome per kilogram. And that's really because the way we measure the drug has changed. So um, if you look at the picture of the, um, the vial with drug in it on the right, um, it shows the two different methods that we use to, to measure drug. The, me the method that we had been using in the phase one study is called the ITR method. And when we use that method, it gives us the number 3e to the 14th. But regulatory agencies have asked us to use a new method, which is on the right. And using that method, the number is 2e to the 14th. And this can be a little confusing, but one way to think about it is um, if you want to weigh yourself and you use a scale that has uses pounds, you'll come up with one number. And if you use a scale that uses kilograms, you'll come up with a different number, but you still weigh the same. It's just that you've used a different measure to, to a different way to measure yourself. So now what I'd like to do is turn to um, a discussion around neutralizing antibodies. Um, this is a really important topic. Um, and I think a lot of people have questions about it. Um, as you know, most of the studies for gene therapy have an inclusion-exclusion criterion for um, neutralizing antibodies. So if you're positive, you're not able to get into the study. I just wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, antibodies, as you probably know, in the, these days are um, part of the um, natural immune um, defense that we have, our, our immune system, um, uses antibodies kind of as a way to remember um, germs, including viruses that come into our body, so that the next time you, you run into that virus, the immune system can respond and, and keep you safe. So if you look at the panel, the picture on the left, it's illustrating what happens when you first run into a virus. Um, at that time, your body doesn't yet have antibodies, and so the virus can, um, can be in your body without an immune response, but within a few weeks, then your body starts to make the antibodies. So then if you look at the right-hand panel, it shows what happens if you get exposed to the virus again, let's say through gene therapy. Then those antibodies are already in your system and they're really ready to attack that virus. And this leads to a couple of things. One is, it causes a very big immune response. And in the case of gene therapy, that immune response can be so big, it can be potentially dangerous. 
And the other thing those antibodies do is they sort of coat the virus and get rid of it so that it can't get into the cells, like it can't get into the muscle cells. And so the gene therapy in that case would not have its intended effect. So that's why we always measure boys before they enter the study to see if they have neutralizing antibodies, because it, if they did, it wouldn't be safe and the um, treatment probably would not be effective. And it's also why we want to measure those, antibody, those neutralizing antibodies again before um, a boy who was assigned to cohort two um, is ready to get the gene therapy in the beginning of the second year. So talking about those boys who might have to wait and might start off the study with having no antibodies, so being negative, but then be tested at, at, again before year two and be positive, this brings me to the topic of zero conversion. Zero conversion is a fancy word, but it just means that. It means at one point you were negative on your neutralizing antibody test and later you were positive, so you're converting from negative to positive. And um, people have been talking about this because one of the things that we don't know yet is um, whether if one boy in a family um, receives the gene therapy and he has a brother with Duchenne, whether that would cause the brother to develop antibodies or to have seroconversion. So the way this might happen is shown in the little picture where um, the boy in the yellow shirt is receiving his gene therapy. And um, it's natural when we first get a virus, whether it's from the environment or through gene therapy, that those viruses come out in our bodily fluids for a little while, like in our saliva. So if that were to happen, and then that boy has a brother living in the house, and the brother comes into contact with that saliva, it's theoretically possible that the virus then gets into the brother's body and then the body makes antibodies. We don't think that would make the brother sick in any way, but if the brother has Duchenne and would like to get gene therapy in the future, then those antibodies um, might make it hard for him to get that gene therapy. So people have been thinking about this and asking questions about it, but the thing is we don't really know yet if this happens because no one's actually tested for it. So now I want to tell you a couple of things we're going to do at Pfizer to get more information so we'll have more facts about this. So the first thing that we're going to be doing is in both our phase 1B study and our phase 3 Cifrio study, we're going to be testing for what's called viral shedding. And that just means the virus coming out in those bodily fluids. So we're going to be sampling things like saliva and urine at regular times after therapy, and then we'll be able to say when is there virus in those fluids and when is it completely gone. The second thing we're going to do is something called um, a household contact substudy. Um, we think this is the first time this has ever been done. And what this will do is, um, is the substudy will be of family members um, who have a boy who's enrolled in the phase three Cifrio study. And we're gonna ask those family members if they would be willing um, to have their blood drawn three times at their home, once before the boy in the Cifrio study is, is treated with gene therapy and twice afterwards. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll, from that blood, we'll test anti the antibodies and once we have the data from all the people who were willing to take part in that sub-study, we'll be able to tell the community whether any of those people did develop antibodies um, in the home of somebody who was treated with gene therapy, about what chance there is that that, that would happen, and also about what time frame it happens um, relative to the time that the boy gets his gene therapy. So we're really hoping that people um, in the community and the family members um, will be willing to sort of contribute to science in this way. We think it's going to help the whole community um, and maybe even be beyond the Duchenne community. So of course it will take us a little bit of time to collect this data and be able to um, share it with the community. So in the meantime, while there's still some questions about it, we're going to also do a couple more things. 
So in our Cifrio phase three trial, if there are two brothers from the same family who both qualify for the study, so they meet all the inclusion exclusion criteria, then what we'll do is we'll assign them to the same cohort at the same time. So at random, they'll either both be assigned to cohort one or to cohort two. And this really eliminates the chance that if one boy were to be assigned to cohort one and get gene therapy right away, the other boy would have to wait a year um, and might have the chance of, of seroconversions. We wanna eliminate that chance. And finally, what we'll do for um, families who have one boy who is able to enroll in the study, but may have a brother at home who doesn't qualify for the study, we're gonna help the study doctors make recommendations to the family about how they can minimize the risk of the brother who's not receiving tr treatment developing antibodies. So that's what I wanted to tell you about today. It was a lot, um, but I um, covered um, our recent data from our phase 1B study that um, allows us to go into phase 3. Um, the fact that our phase 3 study, which is now called the CIFRIO study, will have sites in um, every region of the U.S. and that our dose will be called 2E to the 14th due to a change in the way we measure the, the drug. And lastly, I told you a little bit about seroconversion and neutralizing antibodies and the things we're doing to learn more so that we can give facts to the community, um, measuring viral shedding from the boys who are receiving the gene therapy, measuring antibodies in the family members who are willing to contribute to our sub-study, and also making sure that siblings who qualify for the phase three Cifrio study are randomized to the same cohort. So just wanted to end by thanking PPMD and all the advocacy organizations who work so hard for this community, and of course, to the patients and the families who um, are, are always working hard and making sure that um, new therapies are coming available. And I'm looking forward to a great PPMD conference.